Hello and welcome to our Tacoma Astronomical Society online videos. My name is Alice Few and I am a volunteer with the Tacoma Astronomical Society and this video covers one of our online tools that we've been playing quite a bit with recently and that is Stellarium. Specifically what we're going to do with this video is show you how to use Stellarium and some other information on the web to learn more about meteor showers. So, the interesting thing about meteor showers and the reason why we can say this particular meteor shower is going to happen on a particular set of dates and it's going to peak at a particular date, like the Lyrids or the Perseids or the Leonids, um, is because it is all of the material that's left behind as a comet orbits the Sun. So as a comet gets closer and closer to the Sun and starts getting into the inner part of the solar system, the energy from the sun causes the frozen ices that make up this big dirty snowball in space um, to sublimate. So they start that all of those ices start to break apart and they they basically all of the little elements that are in there, all the bits in, in, of ice and the dust and everything from sand to gravel all just starts to kind of loosen up. And as that comet makes its turn around the sun and heads back out, it leaves a little trail. Um, a good analogy to this is what it would look like if you installed brand new white carpet and then invited the soccer team over after a big muddy game. And those people went walking across your carpet and left behind that trail. It's lots of little stuff, but it's going to stay there, right? So. This is an image and I'm going to show you the interactive that it came from in a minute, but what we have here is this white line is the path of the comet when the comet came through. And so, um, for example, I'll give you the, um, the Lyrid meteor shower is its comet uh, Thatcher. And that's a long period comet. So the last time it came through our solar system was in 1861 and it's another it's one of those comets that won't you won't see around for another 400 500 years so um, we don't have to, we won't see that coming through again in our own lifetime but you can see the path as it comes into the inner solar system and it does kind of cross right very close to Earth's orbit around the Sun so we're gonna zoom in a little bit so you can kind of see that and so here is the orbit in purple of Mercury and then Venus and then this blue one is Earth. Actually Earth is right there and you can see that this is the path the comet left. So all of that dust and sandy and gritty material is all in this area. So every year when we pass through this area we will pass through the leftovers from Comet Thatcher. So let's take a look at the interactive um, for this because I think you'll enjoy it and it's something that you can go do on your own. All right, so here we have Comet Thatcher's path through our solar system and what we have going on here is you can click and hold and pan around. All of the, the planets that you see are moving in their orbits at the rate that they would move in. So we're going to zoom in here to the inner solar system and you can see little Mercury whipping around in there and then Venus and then Earth. So the particles that you see floating around are just kind of reminders that um, it's not, you won't see same, the same meteor shower every year. You won't see the same effect because those particles don't stream off at a fixed rate. As they get closer to the sun, they're going to have more and more sublimation going on, more and more of those ices that are going from solid to gas um, and all of this stuff kind of breaking off as it goes and sometimes things happen in larger chunks and, and so it's kind of an irregular thing and they also tend to move. They're moving at one point and they're going to keep moving in that orbit. Um, so you never have the same meteor shower twice as you work through that. So this little interactive is from meteorshowers.org. You can change the meteor and uh, shower so you can change the comet that you're looking at and that's a good way to take a look at um, also the different types of comets we have. So this is a long period comet. Um, and so if we go and jump over to the Leonids, we have a very different effect here. So um, this particular 
um, comet is Comet Temple Tuttle. And you can see that its complete orbit around the sun is well within um, Uranus's path. So it's one that we would expect to see that comet coming back on a more frequent basis. But it still gets in here right around where Earth is. So all of these little particles that are left here as that comet goes around, um, another analogy is we're heading down the highway and we pass through this whole mass of bugs, right? And everything goes splat on the, the windshield. So these tiny particles, when they hit our atmosphere, um, what you're seeing is you're not actually seeing the particle itself. You're seeing the light that is created from the energy as that particle hits our atmosphere and goes either skipping off the atmosphere or cruising along the atmosphere or into the atmosphere. So those bright flashes of lights are the meteor. That's what the word means. Okay, so there's one. And then another website that is interesting is the International Meteor Organization. So this is an amateur group um, and it's their website, but they have um, some fantastic information on here. And if you go to the main page of the website, they'll have um, information and resources on whatever the next coming um, meteor shower is. The whole volunteers work with different NASA cams and their own cams to do automated tracking. They um, have forms so that if you see a fireball or you see a meteor or you capture one on a camera that you can upload it and send it to them. So there is information here that you can learn all about the, all the different meteor showers and where they come from and there's a link in here as well to that um, interactive that I just showed you. Okay, well let's talk about then how to find those meteor showers and how to observe them. So in the past um, couple of videos we talked a lot about Stellarium. On the Stellarium web version it will help you find the constellations that those meteor showers are in but it doesn't necessarily help you um, get any more information about the meteor shower. So the, the names of the meteor showers come from the name of the constellation that those that those flashes of light appear to be streaming from, right? And so for the Lyra, uh, for the Lyrids, it's Lyra the Harp. And so Lyra the Harp is right here. It's this little constellation here. In the in the springtime, it's pretty low. In the early evening sky, um, but that's where you would find it. And you can also search in the search bar for Lyra and it will pinpoint that for you. Okay, there it is. Alright, so here's Solarium. As it looks when it just pops up for me, I'm going to run time, fast forward time here a little bit to get us some dark skies. Let the sun set. It's going to turn around and look to the north. I just kind of have a generic setting up here. Okay, we're ready for some dark skies. And here we go. So, um, one of the a couple of different ways that you can kind of discover meteor showers using Stellarium is on this bottom bar. See, it's already turned on. There is a little thing that looks like streaming rays of light, and that's the meteor um, shower toggle button. And so, if you click that on, every spot that is the focal point or the radiant point of a meteor shower will show up. So right here is um, the ones that we have coming up for the Lyrids. And so this would make that, you know, Lyra the Harp. Now kind of an interesting side note is that technically the radiant for the Lyrids is in the constellation Hercules, but the problem is is there isn't a very bright a focal point to make it easy to determine where that's coming from. And since Vega is a very, very bright star in Lyra, it makes it really, very easy to tell people to find Vega in Lyra and then look for the the um, radiance here. Because they're not going to be coming from a single point. They're just going to be coming from that zone in the sky. Okay, so another really interesting tool that you have in Stellarium for learning more about meteor showers, when to look for them, 
where to look for them is in this bottom bar as well. And so next to the toggle for the meteor showers is a search button. So it's a meteor shower looking toggle with the magnifying glass on top. And when you pop that open, you can set the search date. So I just put it for the entire year. And then when I say search, it's going to give me a list of all of the different uh, meteor showers that we can see. And it's everywhere, right? Because Stellarium isn't going to be um, hemispheric centric, right? So it's going to show us what we could see, and then it'll tell you later um, whether or not you can see it based on, on where you live on the planet. So you have the name of the shower itself, this um, ZHR, is the Zenith hourly rate, so it's the number of uh, meteors that you could see during a particular hour, so within an hour. Um, the data type is generic, so they've got just here's the normal time we see it, and then as things are confirmed, they show up confirmed, and then the peak, and so they'll show a peak date, but meteor showers, it takes a while, right, for the Earth to move through that point where all of the debris was left behind. So some of those are really thick and spread out, and so you can have a long period of time, like the Perseids, around the peak where you can actually see them. And some are very, very narrow and very thin, and so you have a limited amount of time around the peak to see them, and the Lyrids are an example of that. And so since that one, the Lyrids is sitting right there, if you click on that particular, um, oops, it's not the one I wanted. I wanted the one in April, because there's different variants of, of the different meteor streams. So if you click on the one that you're interested in, and then you double click, what it's going to do is it is um, it's going to take you let's stop time so that all of these numbers move and we'll close this up so it has already moved the date forward to the peak of the meteor shower so the middle part of the, the meteor shower it's already moved that for us oops and I just fell off the I just clicked in the wrong spot and then the other thing it's going to do is it's going to bring up all the information about the meteor shower. So the same way we use the information box to pop up to learn about the planets when we did the using Stellarium video, in this case it's going to take tell us about the meteor shower. So it tells us it's a meteor shower. Um, but some of the fun things it's going to tell you is which constellation to look in, in this case Hercules, um, and it's going to tell you what that parent body is. So in this case, the comet that left behind the debris to create this um, meteor shower is Comet Thatcher. And so if we looked on the Perseids, which we see in August, and we were to do the same thing, we would see that that comet was Swift-Tuttle. And it shows the date range so in this case between the 14th and the 30th of April and it also shows the peak okay so then here is here's another way that we can we can use this so the one thing I want to do is kind of find a good time to see it so they've picked the peak and they've also put the the Lyrids the, the meteor shower when it's at the highest because normally things that are above you you have less interference of light around your horizon, and so it's easier to see things when they're closer to the point above your head. But in this case, at the same time that they've done that, and we're just going to make all of that stuff go away, is they've put it just before dawn, right? The, the day, the, the morning after the peak, so to speak, as the primary time to see it. And that's going to make it hard to see things. So I think what I'm going to do, if I was going to plan this, is still try and keep that constellation as high as possible, but make sure the sun isn't interfering with things. So right now, this is putting me like at 3 o'clock in the morning. So I could probably do things between midnight and 3 and still be able to see it. So what I tend to do when I go see meteor showers, if it's um, if I can get that constellation up, high in the sky above my head, then I'll just lay down on the ground and watch the entire sky. If the constellation is going to be near the horizon, 
right? Then what I tend to do is lay down, point my toes toward that constellation, and then just look up above me in the night sky because they're going to come and they're going to skate kind of across, right, our atmosphere. And so that's usually a pretty good technique for watching those. But the other thing I want to make sure that I check for is what is the phase of the moon, right? So how is that going to affect me and where is the moon? So I'm looking to the east, southeast right now for the Lyrids. And remember, we can always just come over here and just search for the moon. And look, this is great. So the moon is down below the horizon. That's absolutely fantastic. I can... And as close as the moon is to the sun, right, it's just now in waxing crescent phase. Baby, 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 tiny little sliver. So that's fantastic. So I'm not going to have the moon interrupting my night or early morning in this case of watching this meteor shower. So here is a list of some of those resources that we used for this video. And again, my name is Alice View, a volunteer with the Tacoma Astronomical Society.